question raised as to whether uh, when I wrote the box as del mu del mu, I could write it as del mu del mu also just as well it does not matter. In fact, in general if you have two four vectors I have a mu b mu, this could be written in either order, it could also be written as a mu b mu, does not matter in this case, these are all exactly the same thing. Now we were in the middle of our discussion of the electromagnetic field and I introduced a tensor called the electromagnetic field tensor. F mu nu and I define it as del mu a mu minus del mu a mu and it has 6 independent components being an anti-symmetric tensor of rank 2 and the question is how are they related to the electric and magnetic fields. So, if you work this out so, let us start by doing this, let us look at F01 for example, this is del 0 A1 minus del 1 A0. Please remember that del 1 stands for delta over delta x1 which is equal to minus delta over delta x1 which is the same as minus delta over delta x because x superscript 1 is my Cartesian component x. Okay. So, if I put that in this is equal to 1 over C delta over delta t that is del 0 and a 1 of course was phi over c minus on this side uh, is there an extra 1 over c a 1 sorry a 1 is a subscript x the x component of the vector potential a minus del 1 but that becomes a plus delta over delta x a0 which is phi over c. Uh, where did the minus go? I am losing minus signs here. Okay, that is fine, that is fine, both signs are taken care of. Del 0 is 1 over c delta over delta t, a1 is ax, and del 1 has a minus sign, so that cancels against this, gives me a plus here. So, this is equal to 1 over c delta phi uh, 1 over c delta a x over delta t plus delta phi over delta x and this is equal to minus e x over c because the electric field is delta a over delta t plus grad phi with minus signs in both terms. So, recall that E was equal to minus delta A over delta T minus grad phi by definition and the x component of that is precisely this with a minus sign. So, it is minus E x over C. Similarly, F 0 2 would be minus E y over C and F 0 3 would be minus E z over, over C. What would the space space components look like? So, what would F 1 2 look like for instance, this is del 1 a 2 minus del 2 a 1 and that is equal to minus, this is a minus delta over delta x a y plus delta over delta y a x and what is that equal to? Recall also that b equal to curl a. So, what is this equal to? it is minus the z component of the magnetic field because the z component of the magnetic field b z 
is del x uh, delta over delta x a y minus delta over delta y a x. So, it is a minus sign there. Similarly, f 2 3 and f 3 1 would be the magnetic field components. So, we are now ready to write down what f mu nu actually looks like. It is got a 0 here being a diagonal element minus a x over c minus e y over c minus e z over c and it is an anti-symmetric tensor. So, therefore, these components here would be just the positives corresponding positive values. over C and a 0 on the diagonal and then the 0 1 component. So, this is 0 0 0 1 0 2 0 3 and then a 1 0 a 1 1 a 1 2 and so on and the 1 2 we already figured out was minus B z this becomes a plus B y and then since it is anti symmetric you have a B z here diagonal 0 this is minus B y here since it is anti symmetric diagonal 0 and this is minus b x b x. So, that is what the field tensor looks like. Its components give you the components of the electric and magnetic fields. Okay. What does uh, the lower thing look like? What does f mu nu look like? This is equal to you have to lower these two indices. So, it is g mu sigma g nu rho f sigma rho. So, you see I want to bring that index sigma down I do a g out here I want to bring the index rho down. So, I do a g here with a nu sigma and rho are dummy indices and that is what this uh, the covariant version of this tensor is and we could write that down as a matrix also this thing here will of course, have zeros everywhere in the diagonals. It is also an anti symmetric tensor, and the question is what does, for example, what does F01 look like? This this element here, 0, 01. What would it be? Well, it is clear that these G's, so you would like to find F01, and that is equal to G0 sigma, G1 rho, F sigma rho. You have to substitute for these indices and then sum over the remaining two indices the dummy indices sigma and rho. But it is clear that this vanishes unless sigma is 0 and this vanishes unless rho is equal to 1. But g 1 1 is a minus 1 and g 0 0 is a plus 1. So, the answer is that this is equal to component wise minus sigma 0 1 everything else vanishes. So, all you have to do is to put a minus sign there and then this is A x over C, E y over C, E z over C and this side you have a minus A x over C, minus E y over C, minus E z over C. Okay. What does F 1 2 do? Well, this is 1 2 now. So, this is 1 sigma and a 2 rho and you have to sum over it. And again, the only thing that contributes is g11, and the only thing that contributes there is g22. And each of them is minus, minus one, and the product is plus one, which tells you that this doesn't change at all. Numerically, f12 is equal to plus f12 upstairs. In which case, we can simply write it down. It's minus b z b y minus b x and this side is B z and minus B y plus B x. So, that is the covariant version of this rank 2 tensor. It is clear that the entire uh, set of fields the E x and E y all the components are included here in this field tensor. So, in a sense what has happened and you can check this out easily is that this definition that we have is like a four dimensional curl. It is the equivalent of the curl except that the indices now run from 0 to 4, 0 to 3. And while these two relations look completely unlike each other, they really are the same the kind of relation and they are both very symmetrically written out in terms of a four dimensional curl. This itself should tell you 
that electricity and magnetism, electric and magnetic fields are intimately connected to each other. Really, they are just one field, electromagnetic field. It is just that when you write it in terms of three dimensional vectors, you artificially end up with expressions for them which look very, very different. But this expression, which is a time derivative and a gradient, and this expression here, which is a curl of a vector field, really, once you put them together in a four vector potential, really is the curl of this four vector potential. It is exactly the same relation. So, this tells you that these fields are intimately rel related to each other, and we will see how much closer when we do Lorentz transformations on them. What about the field equations themselves? First of all, before I do that, what kind of invariant can you get from this? Well, what you have to do is to take the Lorentz scalar f mu nu f mu nu, write this out, and what does that give you? This is equal to if you put things in, uh, we take this and contract it with that. So, it is just the sums of the squares of all the terms because this is going to be completely contracted. So, all you have to do is to take this, take this, take this, etcetera, and multiply and add the whole thing. And what do you get? You get minus twice E vector squared over C squared from the electric terms and the magnetic terms would be B squared, B y squared, B x squared. So, these things give you twice the magnetic field squared. So, this is plus twice B vector squared. Now, let us pull things out. So, this is equal to in units which you are familiar with 1 over C squared by the way recall 1 over C squared is mu naught epsilon naught. So, in units which you are familiar with this is equal to minus twice uh, mu naught E squared uh, epsilon naught E squared plus B square minus minus B squared over mu naught. Write it in this fashion. And if you put them together and take out a minus one fourth, so minus one quarter F mu nu F mu nu is equal to mu naught times. 1 half epsilon naught E vector squared minus 1 over 2 mu naught B vector squared. This is the Lagrangian density of the free electromagnetic field. So, although we have not proved it in this course, if you took this quantity, this is a density now, it has the dimensions of an energy density. This object, if you do Euler Lagrange equations on it for fields, you, are, you recover the Maxwell equations. So, this is really the Lagrangian density L for the electromagnetic field. The energy density of this field is the same thing with a plus sign here in these units. Now, let us go and look at what the Maxwell equations themselves look like and how to write them. Consider what happens to this quantity. So, let us look at del mu f mu nu, what this does and let us see what uh, this quantity gives. What kind of object is this? Is it a scalar, vector, tensor, what is it? This index mu is summed over and there is one free index. So, it is a vector with an upstairs index, uh, single vector. So, let us look at uh, del mu f mu 0 for example. It has got four components. Let us look at the 0 component, the time component. That is this object. This is equal to del 0 f 0 0, but f 0 0 is 0 because it is an anti-symmetric tensor. And so, this is equal to del 1 f 1 0 plus del 2 f 2 0 plus del 3 f 3 0. 
and what does that give you? Del 1 is delta over delta x and what is f 1 0? It is this quantity here uh, minus E x over C. So this is equal to minus 1 over C E x sitting here plus del 2 f 0 that is delta over delta y. Pardon me? Plus Cx. Uh, did I make a mistake? 1 0, sorry, it is here. That is right, it is plus 1 0 and then this and then Ey plus delta z over delta z. So that is equal to, but this quantity is the divergence of E as you can see. So this is equal to uh, 1 over C del dot T. This is equal to 1 over C rho over epsilon naught. That is equal to mu naught 1 over C epsilon naught. Where does that give you? Uh, notice that we are going to use this. Uh, we are going to use this term 1 over mu naught epsilon naught equal to c squared or c square or epsilon naught equal to 1 over mu naught c squared. Pardon me? Well, let us instead of roots, I just want to write instead of epsilon naught. So, let me write this as c squared mu naught. So, this is mu naught c rho which is equal to mu naught j 0. Remember that j mu consisted of c rho and the vector uh, and uh, the, vec uh, the vector current, the current density. So you have del mu f mu naught is mu naught apart from this unit j 0. Okay. Similarly, I do 1, 2 and 3 out here and the result would be that I end up with the two Maxwell equations, I end up with del mu f mu nu equal to mu naught j nu and this encompasses the two Maxwell equations del dot E equal to rho over epsilon naught and del cross B equal to mu naught j plus mu naught epsilon naught delta E over delta T the two inhomogeneous Maxwell equations are re-expressed in this form. So this is a much more compact way of writing these two equations. So now you begin to see that these two equations, the inhomogeneous equations are really two parts of the same equation. They really say that the divergence, this is the divergence of this tensor of the field tensor is the current. So that is what the inhomogeneous equations say. There are still two equations left, the homogeneous equations and we have to check out what they say. They are obviously going to say what the other two equations say, but what is the way of doing this? Well, I leave you to verify, verify that del dot B equal to 0 and del cross E equal to minus delta B or plus delta B. Over delta t equal to 0, these two equations together they correspond to a statement that del, uh, del let us use some notation mu f mu sigma plus uh, del mu f sigma mu plus del sigma mu nu equal to 0. So this is in cyclic per permutation of these three indices and it says this plus that plus that is equal to 0. That looks like a strange sort of relation. Hmm. This set of equations is a deep identity in tensor calculus. It is called the Bianchi identity and it occurs in general relativity. It occurs in many other contexts as well, but let me rewrite it in another form which is a little more convenient to understand and that is the following. 
whenever you have a tensor of this kind I need these two expressions so I want to retain them whenever you have a tensor of this kind you can also define what is called a dual tensor. So let me do that here and it is defined as F tilde mu nu equal to uh, epsilon mu nu sigma rho F sigma rho that is a half. So you introduce the totally anti-symmetric symbol the Levi Civita symbol the tensor which I introduced in three dimensions the epsilon i j k the analog of that in four dimensions here this quantity is equal to plus one if you have an even permutation of the natural order 0 1 2 3 minus one if you have an odd permutation and zero whenever any two indices are equal. How many components does this object have? 4 power 4 yeah 4 to the power 4 that is 256 but a lot of them are 0. How many are non-zero? 24 4 factorial that is the number of permutations of 0 1 2 3 of them 12 would be plus 1 12 would be minus 1 and the rest would all be 0. So this Levi Civita symbol in four dimensions has 24 non-zero components and you take that and contract two of these indices here you end up with this tensor. Is this symmetric or anti-symmetric this tensor? It is anti-symmetric because the epsilon symbol is completely anti-symmetric under the interchange of any two of its indices. So this is also equal to minus F tilde mu mu automatically. Now you have to sit down and compute those quantities. So let us see what F tilde 0 1 looks like. This is equal to 1 half epsilon 0 1 sigma rho F sigma rho and what can this be? What can sigma and rho possibly be? 2 and 3 they just have to be 2 and 3 everything else is 0 right. So this is equal to 1 half F 2 3 minus F 3 2 minus because if you interchange and make this an order which is an odd permutation of 0 1 2 3 you get a minus sign. But what is F 2 3? This is F 2 and then a 3 you are out here and it is a minus B x F, F 2 3 downstairs is a minus B x out here and 3 2 of course is a plus B x. So what does this give you? is a minus p x. So what this dual tensor does and you can easily check out the rest of it is that while the original field tensor has the time space components are the electric fields or the space time components are the electric fields the space space components are the magnetic fields in the dual tensor these are the magnetic fields and these are the electric fields. So it exchanges the electric and magnetic fields. And in a sense you know going back to the Maxwell equations you know this is giving you the divergence of the electric field and the curl of the magnetic field. So it is really telling you what are the equations that depend on the sources. In the magnetic case there are no sources there is no magnetic monopole there are no magnetic charges isolated magnetic charges. So that is why you get 0 on the right hand side here and so you expect to get a 0 here and you expect a relation pretty much like this relation here and not surprisingly this set of equations can actually be written as del mu f mu nu tilde equal to 0. So these two equations are that and this equation is this. So it is a very compact way of writing the electromagnetic field equations not the most compact way there is a sort of a joke about this that when Maxwell first wrote his equation down he wrote all the components because he was not uh, they were not too uh, vector calculus had not become very popular he wrote it everything down in Cartesian components 
and then vector calculus came along and then people wrote these four equations down here. After that tensor calculus came along then people wrote these two equations down here and that is Maxwell's equations. Today when we use differential geometry we write it much more simply in that you do not even write so much you really write only two symbols and that is it d f and d star f and that is it and that is that is it those are the equations. So, it is a very natural geometrical structure sitting here inside here and as time goes along you write it more and more compactly more and more information written down in fewer and fewer symbols. In particular this thing here is actually an identity in some senses consistency condition you need it explicitly need it okay. So, we are not going to do that, but what I would like to do is having written the Maxwell equations down in terms of the field tensor we could ask is there any other quantity that is also a Lorentz scalar. It is easy to see that if you took f tilde mu nu f tilde mu nu you would not get anything new because all that is happened between the f's and the uh, f tildes is that the electric and magnetic fields have got exchanged and you would get exactly the same thing as you got apart from some factor essentially e squared minus b squared. But you could ask what about this quantity I contract the dual tensor with this object here with the original field tensor here and what would you get. Well you can actually see what you are going to get this thing here had an E x had an E x, but in the magnetic case you got a B x here and you multiply you get an E dot B. So, this whole thing is going to look like E dot B. So, I leave you to work this out this is going to start looking like E dot B. So, you have two invariants of an electromagnetic field one of which is uh, f mu nu f mu nu contracted with itself and the other is it contracted with its dual tensor here. But there is a little caveat here this is not truly an invariant under all possible transformations because this object is not a real tensor this object is called a tensor density it is a pseudo tensor in the sense that if you go from a right handed to a left handed coordinate system this changes sign this object changes sign. Therefore, what you have here is a pseudo scalar and if you say electromagnetic interactions are invariant electromagnetism is invariant under parity transformations then this is not an invariant you need to square this object here. It is invariant under proper Lorentz transformations I am going to come back to Lorentz transformations, but you need to square this object here and it is not hard to show that there are no other invariants just these two guys. All right. The next step is to ask what happens under Lorentz transformations. For this I have to go back now and rewrite Lorentz transformations in more efficient way and let us do that. So, let us go right back and rewrite uh, Lorentz and let us focus not so much on rotations which you have studied to some extent and seen what they do but rather on velocity transformations or boosts. In particular let us look at the simplest of these guys the one the where I start with a frame of reference s with an x y z here and I move to another frame of reference which is moving along the x axis of the original x direction of the original frame at uniform speed. So, this is x prime y prime z prime and this is the observer s prime. And we have the Lorentz equation transformation equations which says t prime is equal to c t prime is c t minus x v over c times what I will call gamma let us just call it gamma x prime is equal to gamma x minus v t v over c c t y prime is y z prime z and gamma is equal to 1 minus v squared over c squared to the power minus a half. These are linear transformations and they are 1 to 1 it is invertible and we would like to write this in a more efficient notation. I would like to write a general Lorentz transformation in a more efficient notation. So, let me do that let us say x under a Lorentz transformation goes to x prime 
space time point x goes to a space time point x prime and in component form x mu prime this is really x prime mu but x mu prime is equal to well, let us write it properly x prime the mu component is some matrix lambda mu mu x mu. I want to keep track of the fact that whenever I contract an index must have one downstairs one upstairs index. So, let me introduce this notation there is some matrix lambda of Lorentz transform uh, representing the Lorentz transformation it is mu nu element when contracted here with respect to nu gives you the nu coordinate. So, every component of the nu set of coordinates is a linear combination of the old coordinates and space time coordinates by this rule here. So, this lambda is a matrix uh, 4 by 4 matrix with elements lambda mu and a mu. So, just to keep track of the fact that I have this upstairs and downstairs indices and so on I put a mu here and then leave a space and write a mu there. In our case we can write this down very easily because lambda 0 0 would be equal to what? Just gamma because x naught is C t so we just have a gamma and what would be lambda 0 1 0 and a 1 it would be this coefficient here gamma v over c and similarly on this side it would have a minus gamma v over c and then the diagonal element would be just gamma. So, in our case this lambda matrix would look like this set of equations would look like out here it would be just a gamma minus gamma v over c minus gamma v over c and a gamma because my space time point x mu is defined as x naught equal to c t and then x y z that is my column vector representing a space time point. And what happens here and here? There are zeros in this particular case and then there is a, a 1 0 in this particular case this is what you get. Now, we would like to write this in a slightly better way it happens to be in this form in this particular case it happens to be a symmetric matrix, but there is no reason why that should be the case in general. We need to derive a condition in general on what happens. So, let us do that completely in general given this let us calculate what is x mu prime equal to what is that equal to hmm? yeah there would be a g that go goes on this right. So, this is equal to g mu sigma x sigma prime x prime sigma because the g the metric tensor is the same in all frames of reference it is an isotropic tensor for in flat space time in our case. So, what does this give you this is equal to g mu sigma and then there is a lambda uh, we need a sigma there. So, this is equal to sigma rho x rho because x prime sigma is lambda sigma rho x rho that is the Lorentz transformation and then I need a g to bring this guy down sigma. Therefore, what is x mu prime x prime mu x prime mu equal to that is the product of these two fellows. So, it is equal to uh, lambda mu mu g mu sigma this may not be the best way to write it, but anyway it would not matter lambda sigma rho and then x nu x rho let us just check that the dummy indices are summed this is summed over it is a scalar. So, mu is gone 
the nu is gone the sigma is gone and the rho is gone so it is perfectly all right and every index has one downstairs and one upstairs so the contraction is correct but this must be equal to x mu x mu that is the point about a Lorentz transformation it leaves this scalar product the distance space time distance in four dimensions invariant just as rotations left the ordinary Euclidean distance invariant but this could also be written I like to write this as x rho x rho if you like so you could write this as x rho x rho or g let us put a g here uh, rho nu x nu x rho I want to be able to compare with that so I rewrite this quantity till I write that x nu x rho and this is true for every x that is only possible if lambda nu nu g nu sigma lambda sigma rho equal to g rho nu or nu rho does not matter g is a symmetric tensor so instead of g rho nu I can write g rho nu rho. Now please notice that this g can be written as a matrix and this matrix g was equal to 1 0 0 0 0 minus 1 0 0 0 minus 1 0 minus 1. So this looks like the matrix multiplication here because this follows a matrix a matrix whose sigma rho element is lambda sigma rho. So it looks like the matrix mu uh, g is getting multiplied by the matrix sigma but that is not happening here because unfortunately if mu were here and nu were there then this would be matrix multiplication but what element is this it is the element of the transpose right so this could be written therefore this implies lambda transpose g lambda equal to g that is the orthogonality condition pseudo orthogonality look at how similar it looks to what happened in the case of symplectic transformations in classical mechanics the metric there was that matrix j that I wrote down the anti-symmetric matrix and that was m transpose j m equal to in the case of ordinary Euclidean matrix and rotations you had r transpose r equal to the identity matrix. So this is exactly the same structure except that now literally your metric is g in this space and it is not hard to see from here that lambda inverse exists lambda inverse is the inverse transformation you go from s to s prime you can go from s prime to s always so lambda inverse certainly exists and you can write down what its property is in fact you can write lambda transpose in terms of lambda inverse so let us just play with that remember that g squared is the identity matrix you square g you get the identity matrix so g inverse is the same as g and therefore if you play with that here what are you going to get uh, you put a g inverse on the left hand side you get g inverse lambda transpose uh, there are many ways of doing this g lambda equal to the identity matrix put a lambda inverse on either side and you get lambda inverse on this side but g inverse is the same as g so there you are so lambda inverse is g lambda transpose g similarly you can write lambda transpose in terms of lambda inverse so what does lambda transpose do uh, you have lambda inverse which is also a Lorentz transformation and then uh, put a g inverse on the right hand side that is a g you put a g inverse on the left that is g and it is not hard to see it is a trivial exercise to show that this also implies lambda g lambda transpose is also g in other words if lambda is a Lorentz transformation matrix lambda inverse of course is a Lorentz transformation matrix lambda transpose is also a Lorentz transformation matrix in this particular case lambda transpose turned out to be the same as lambda but that is special to this particular transformation 
there could be all sorts of rotations sitting here, there could be complicated boosts and so on, not true in general. In general lambda transpose is this in terms of lambda inverse, now these transformations form a group the Lorentz group and the group of these matrices is a set of rotations, it is like rotations, it is almost like rotations and these lambdas are elements of a group called S O 3 comma 1. I have to explain a little bit more about the determinants and so on. Let us take determinants on both sides. You have determinant lambda whole squared times determinant g is equal to determinant g. Therefore, determinant lambda can be either plus 1 or minus 1. Once again, the proper Lorentz transformations, the ones you can get from the identity from no transformation at all would be the ones with determinant plus 1. There is a little more to this and that has to do with the following. I will come back and talk about it uh, a little bit. I need to do that now, so let me do that. Included in these lambdas are transformations where the time itself can be reversed also. They would still satisfy a condition of this kind. So, you really have four classes of transformations. You have those, and these are denoted by the Lorentz group, you have those for which the determinant is plus 1 and the direction of time is not reversed written in this form. Then you have determinant plus 1, but the direction of time is inverted and then you have those in which you have parity and stuff like that. So, you have L minus determinant minus 1 time upwards and minus down here. So, together this set of transformations forms the full set of proper Lorentz transform uh, uh, set of homogeneous Lorentz transformations. Of those the ones that keep these are the ones connected to the identity these keep the direction of time and I will come back and explain what the light cone is. This implies this is the set of transformations for which determinant lambda is equal to plus 1 and lambda 0 0 is greater than equal to 1. What was lam, uh, lambda 0 0 the coefficient of t, uh, t in the expansion of t prime what was it in our previous case? it was gamma and that number was certainly greater than 1 because it was 1 over square root 1 minus v squared over c squared it was greater than 1. So, these are called proper orthochronous Lorentz transformations. We will see we will see in a minute why this is so as you can see pardon me yeah this would mean determinant is plus 1 and this would mean determinant is minus 1 and this would mean the direction of time is not reversed whereas the downward arrow would mean the direction is reversed now as you know since we didn't mention it let me mention it here uh, this quantity x mu x mu is a lorentz scalar and it has three possibilities. It is a real number, it could be positive, negative, or 0. Now, if this number is equal to 0, this would imply c squared t squared equal to r, r squared. This is the way light would propagate. So, actually, this equation would tell you something about the way light propagates because for light, r is equal to c t. For material objects, what would happen if I throw a ball? at constant speed and it moves in a straight line what kind of uh, uh, c squared t squared minus r squared do you get is c squared t squared greater than or less than r squared greater than because it does not travel as much as c t would therefore this is called a light like 4 vector x mu on the other hand greater than 0 is called a time like vector x mu and less than 0 is called a space like and what the invariance under Lorentz transformation tells you is that a light like 4 vector is going to remain a light like 4 vector under Lorentz transformations because it is a scalar quantity does not change in value. 
Similarly, a time like one would remain time like, a space like one would remain space like. Therefore, every one of us at every instant of time is carrying a light cone in our frame of reference. So, in my frame of reference, if this is the origin and I draw time here versus space here. I cannot draw three directions in space and a time, I need four dimensions to do that. Let us take one particular direction here. Then, if I shoot a beam of light in a particular direction along this spatial direction, that beam of light, so let us let us draw C T here, C T versus x, for example. As time goes on, it is going to trace a path which looks like this, x is equal to C T. If I shoot in the negative x direction, it is going to look like this. Its path is going to look like this. This is called a world line of this object. On the other hand, if I receive a pulse of light coming from the left hand side at t equal to 0, that light would have traveled along this line to meet me here at t equal to 0. And similarly, from the other direction would look like this. Now, really you have a y and a z also. So, these are really like cones except they are not even in uh, three dimensions, but they are in four dimensions. And this thing here is called a light cone. Yeah. Pardon me? Something coming along from the negative x direction so that I receive it at the origin at t equal to 0. No. Why is it traveling backwards? It is coming like this from that side and it hits me at t equal to 0. So, it came from my past and it is evident from here that this is my future and this is my past. So, everything that happened to me, all the space time events with which I am causally connected come from here and that is going to be my future. This is called the future light cone and this is the past light cone. Now, if you stand there at t equal to 0, we are both in the same of frame, same frame of reference and you stand there and you are here with respect to me and you throw a ball to me and I catch this ball sometime in the future. What would the path of this ball look like? Clearly, it is going to meet me somewhere here and you are going to throw it. You have your own light cone and when you throw a ball at me at constant speed, let us assume there is no acceleration etcetera in a straight line. This cannot have a speed greater than the speed of light. Therefore, to travel a given distance, it is going to take a longer time than light does. So, the slope of the world line of the ball is going to be greater than 1 it's going to go like this and eventually at some time in the future it meets me that's the world line of this ball hmm? right so now anything in my frame of reference this object etc etc all these things have world lines i have a world line i don't do anything i just stand here i still have a trajectory in the space time diagram I just stand here and get older and wiser up this cone, right. I start moving about then I am doing crazy things that would be my path, but the fact is that the slope of that can never exceed 1, it is always got to be less than 1. Okay. So, if you and I throw catch, play catch, then this is going to have a zigzag path in this fashion here. My entire past has come from here, everything causally connected to me. So, material particles will have trajectories which are time like, the world lines would be always time like. Light would have things which travel along with speed 1, with the slope 1 here. Then you can ask, what is this guy? What is the space time point here going to do? This point and me are not causally connected that is elsewhere and else when. Okay. 
no event there is causally connected to me. There is no way in which I can send a signal to this person. In fact, I can make a Lorentz transformation. This vector, this vector here is a space like vector because the square of this object is negative the space time square four dimensional square is negative. So, this whole region is space like for me and there is a simple way of demonstrating from the Lorentz transformation equations that if these two points are separated by a space like separation, it is possible to go to a frame of reference where the difference is made purely space like. So, this picture can be changed to look like, so here is O and here is A. It can be changed in a primed frame, so this is in a given frame, this is a, a, a Lorentz transformed frame such that O is here and A is here. What does that imply? It says if you have this quantity c squared t squared minus r squared, then this, this quantity numerically cannot be changed when you go from one frame of reference to another. But if this quantity is negative, it is possible to go to a frame of reference such that this is equal to minus r prime squared, purely space like separation. In other words, these two look simultaneous. So, this is why it is say in relativity simultaneity is relative. When the separation is space like you can always go to a frame in which these two events appear to be simultaneous. On the other hand, so this quantity is negative, so 0 greater than this. On the other hand, if 0 is less than c squared t squared minus r squared, so you have one event here and another space time event here, this is A, it is always possible to go to a frame of reference where O is here and A is here. In other words, the separation can be made completely time like, fully time like. So, this can also be written as C squared T prime squared. So, space like separations can be made pure space like, time like separations can be made pure time like. How would I do this for a particle that is moving in space with some given velocity v? How would I make its uh, four, four momentum time like? What would I do? It is moving in some frame of reference. I discover that its energy is E and its three momentum is P. And I know that E squared by C squared minus P vector squared is M squared C squared. And a physical particle has a positive M, non-negative non M. Now, let us say I have a positive M. Then this quantity is invariant as I make Lorentz transformations from one frame to another. And this is the four vector of the particle. How do I make this purely time like? What should I do? fix a frame to the particle, go to its rest frame. If I go to its rest frame, it has only rest energy which is positive and the p is 0. So, from there you can go to another frame of reference in which this can go to another frame of reference in which this is equal to m squared c 4 or on the way it is written m squared c squared and 0. It has no momentum, linear momentum. I am going sitting along with it, but it still has rest energy, and that is mc squared. Okay. Sorry, e is m. e over c, so mc must have dimensions momentum. Okay. So, the four vector looks like mc and a 0. Okay. Now, we can ask what is this particle, where is it going to lie as it moves along. So, we could actually plot 
where this particle is going to be in the momentum space. So let us say here is P and here is the energy E over C. Light will be E equal to Cp always. So light would propagate like this. Okay. By this P I mean x, y, z component they are all sitting there so it is really on a cone. Okay. What would a massive particle look like? What would the energy momentum relation for a massive particle look like? What does this relation look like? So pretend for a moment that this is this is Px squared plus Py squared plus Pz squared. So let me plot it as a function of P, Px alone for example. What would this look like if the motion is purely along the x direction say? You have the curve always it must satisfy E squared over C squared minus Px squared equal to M squared C squared which is a positive number. So when Px is 0 it is here and therefore it is on a hyperbola. But it is possible if its energy had been negative it would also have another sheet here the hyperbola would have another sheet. These are disconnected but this corresponds to negative energy solutions and in classical physics we are not bother about this. It is on this object here this is a hyperboloid it is called the mass shell because whatever E and P do it must remain on that as long as it is a free particle. If it were space like if you had particles with negative rest masses for example imaginary rest masses so that that thing can, there can be negative if you had such objects if this were negative then what would this hyperbola look like? It would really look like this and like this and remember you are in three dimensions so this is connected this guy here is connected so it is really it is completely connected this hyperboloid is connected on this side but that is a space like hyperboloid physical particles do not live there particles with imaginary mass could in quantum field theory you have to deal with those situations you have to deal with what happens outside also but you have to also impose causality in the correct way we are concerned with this the hyperboloid the positive energy. And if you are in the rest frame of the particle it just stays here but if it starts moving then it is on this shell all the time. Okay. Now we have to ask I have run out of time so tomorrow what we will do is we will go back and ask what the Lorentz transformations do to the electric and magnetic fields. Now that we have this condition now that we have this exact condition lambda transpose g lambda is equal to g we can write this lambda out in more efficient form and that is what I will do and then show you what happens to the electric and magnetic fields under these transformations. We will look at a few more things this kind okay so let me stop here. Mm -hmm.